becoming obvious. It has been obvious for many of us with practicing AI. Algorithm is becoming commodity at this point. So you can download open source, you can download big language models, and you can use it. The key differentiator of AI is on data. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Whether you've passed your cursor over their logo on a streaming service, spotted it on the front of a Golden State Warriors jersey, or used their cashback rebate system, the Rakuten brand is everywhere and actively expanding. Today's guest, Takuya Kitagawa, is the Managing Executive Officer and CDO at Rakuten. On this episode, Takuya joins Cindy to discuss how the company has found massive international success across multiple industries by integrating data across lines of business to deliver better customer experiences. He also dives into the importance of data fluency at every level and elaborates on how Rakuten is leveraging the concept of digital twins to better connect with customers. Stick around to hear all of this, plus exciting details regarding Rakuten's latest moonshot projects. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. Takuya-san, welcome to the Data Chief. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining all the way from Tokyo, correct? Yes. And you are our first guest joining us from Japan. So welcome. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yes. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> We're honored. Um, Rakuten is such an interesting brand. So for those who are not familiar with it, tell us a little bit about it. Yes. So Rakuten uh, is, uh, you know, an uh, internet uh, conglomerate uh, company. Uh, we have uh, more than 70 services running under our roof, uh, including uh, fintech businesses such as credit card, insurance, securities, online bank, uh, e-commerce company uh, such as shopping, travel booking, golf booking, and also mobile career business we uh, started a few years ago uh, and others. So we are basically uh, spanning uh, pretty much all the lifestyles of customers. And uh, we are uh, becoming an infrastructure society. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And even though you are in Japan, um, Rakuten is really global. So in so many mm-hmm. countries. Uh, so we, uh, we are partnering with, you know, say you to uh, try to build, help a supermarket in Japan. Uh, to digital transform uh, its operations and its services. So right. we've been actually running our online supermarket businesses for a while. And uh, we basically decided to you know, take another step further into you know, uh, uh, transforming the supermarket businesses uh, together with you know, uh, Seiyu. Right, thank you. So a lot of different industry verticals, but a common theme is the digital, the digital business and online. As a digital native company, tell me how it's changed over the last few years and what really attracted you to join them? Yes, Uh, so one big transformation we made, uh, originally Rakuten started off as an e-commerce company uh, and we expanded our, you know, uh, businesses. Uh, very early in the stage, we started acquiring, you know, uh, uh, travel booking services, and also, you know, acquire uh, fintech businesses like credit card. Now, after we made success with fintech businesses, uh, we actually, from I would say three years ago, uh, started challenging uh, mobile industry. Uh, in Japan, traditionally, uh, the uh, mobile industry is dominated by three players. Uh, you know, SoftBank, um, NTT, Docomo, and the KDDI. And uh, we, we made the entrance to uh, the industry with the hope that we can lower uh, the price of uh, data uh, in Japan. So previously, you know, uh, uh, customers are paying about, I would say $50, $70 per month. Now uh, we are offering services, which is uh, less than half of the price so that's uh, you know uh, next challenge we are going 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 through, 
And uh, along the way, it, you know, we always, you know, I had different services offering. So the integration of the different services into, you know, one lifestyle is uh, uh, always our, you know, kind of journey uh, to integrate and make, uh, you know, our experiences better for the customer. Yeah, so really um, using digital to provide more services at half the price. Yes. And tell me the role of data in that. Yes. Um, there are many areas, uh, of course, we use data for. Uh, one of the biggest success, this is more of a, you know, a business perspective rather than customer experience perspective. And I want to talk about customer experiences uh, you know, uh, later. But from more business uh, perspective, the innovation we are making is actually uh, to simply put you know, marketing and how to actually think about you know, customer acquisition cost. And interesting thing is, uh, we discovered when we acquired a credit card company that it's much, much cheaper to send traffic from one service, internal service to the other uh, than going through, of course, you know, advertisement uh, uh, companies, uh, you know, such as Google and Facebook. Uh, even though, you know, and, and this takes a little bit of ingenuity and creativity that, you know, if you think about it, you know, e-commerce and credit cards come really well together you know, because, you know, you know, to shop online, you need a credit card. And, right. uh, uh, and the key but point is, how do you connect a uh, credit card back to the shopping? You know, that's no obvious statement. The, the uh, tool we decided to invent was actually uh, something called Rakuten Super Points, which is something like a cashback, but it's a currency that only can flow uh, within Rakuten ecosystem. So, credit cards that we, we have decided to issue or you know, uh, uh, give back 1% uh, monetary value to the customer in the form of points. So what happened was you know, when customers actually spend $1,000 on credit cards, online, offline, anywhere, they can get back $10 uh, uh, as points, and then they can use it, redeem it in our uh, e-commerce site. So in that way, you actually, uh, you know, once people start having credit card, they started actually coming back to our, you know, e-commerce site every month, you know, once a month, for example. And that turned the customer into a very heavy customer of e-commerce. So basically this connection between uh, uh, a shopping site and uh, uh, credit card were created uh, through Rakuten Superpoints. Thank you for explaining that. So really, in a way, it's like... a. a um integrated customer loyalty where, yeah. yeah. So if you think um, maybe if I had MasterCard or American Express, then I'm going to get miles on that and I can use that um, either at a particular store, but that's a business partner. Whereas at Rakuten, it's totally integrated. That's correct. So data play a essential role in this integration because, you know, you can uh, deeply know what customers uh, are, are wanting in each of the services. And not only a surface level integration that we can do because it's, uh, it's, it's owned by, uh, all of them are owned by us. Uh, another good example is, you know, we have uh, one of the biggest you know, online banking service in Japan. And we also have, uh, you know, a, a security uh, service, which is, you know, uh, uh, stock buying, right? Stock buying and selling. So it's like a Robin Hood of Japan. And when you actually integrate them, uh, the way you integrate is, you know, because both of them are government regulated uh, industry, you know, there's a strong, you know, KYC requirement, you know, uh, uh, you know, know your customer requirements uh, to check uh, the identity of the customer. But as it turns out, uh, this, you know, identity uh, require, uh, uh, identification requirement is similar to uh, these two services. They are both very strict, but, you know, are very similar. So therefore, you actually could connect the onboarding process of you know, banking service and the security service and make it you know, conversion rate much, much higher. Uh, second is, you know, uh, we even integrated you know, uh, the uh, account. So when, when you have uh, you know, uh, uh, money in, in uh, online banking, it's, we made it extremely easy to buy stocks uh, in the security side by doing an automatic you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, very smooth uh, you know, movement of the fund from bank to the security, which is, you know, a, a, a very, very nice feature. So, you know, those, those kind of, you know, uh, 
tight integration of the data is, is very essential. Yeah, so the tight integration with data allows your customers to interact and transact better. How are you using that data to better service them and personalize the experience without crossing into, you'll have to forgive me with the slang, but what we would say as creepy, that you know too much about me. Yes, but you know, if you think about my examples uh, I gave previously, they're all about user experiences, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if users have to, you know, log into security service and they have to actually, you know, uh, manually transfer the fund from bank to the security to buy stocks to, you know, run their, you know, investment, uh, that's very painful. So, you know, uh, uh, it is all about user experiences. So, you know, uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, I guess maybe this is a one point I wanted to mention, which is, you know, uh, current data, when we talk about, you know, data science and AI, you know, we often talk about like, uh, you know, uh, additional uh, user experience layer on top of actual service that exists. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe more like a little bit service level integration is what we often talk about. When you actually, you know, uh, have a very tight integration between AI and the service itself, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't feel like, you know, uh, 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 AI or data science anymore. It's just a service itself, right? So yeah. that, that's uh, maybe that's uh, one of the key points. So, you know, yes, you know, uh, we use in a, a data in a very essential way to serve the customer and that dramatically improve the customer experiences in a non-creepy way, because that's the core of uh, you know, service rather than just uh, you know, something on top of the service. Right, so AI is not an afterthought. It's exactly. core to the products and shopping experience or transacting experience. Exactly. So, you know, of, of course, you know, we do, uh, you know, typical, uh, you know, uh, uh, thingy, right? In recommendation engine, you know, targeting, you know, uh, issuing coupons according to customers likelihood to purchase. So all those things we do, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, those are becoming more commodity, right? Right, and, uh, right. Uh, to, and to your point though, about, you know, not trying not to be creepy, it's all about understanding what customers really want, right? So if you un deeply understand what customers really want and provide them what they want, then it's not creepy, it's just, you know, very helpful. Right? So the, the boundary between creepy and helpful is, you know, if it's creepy, then it's probably a little bit misjudging what customers truly want, right? Yeah. And, uh, it, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, either misjudging or using the data in a way that is not helpful, that does not serve right. them. That would be exactly. the difference. So you mentioned about lowering the customer acquisition cost. Are you allowed to share any specific uh, hard business benefits on how those costs have decreased? So, you know, a uh, very clear one, right? So in clear car business, we give back about $50, well, not give back, I should give away <laughs> $50 when customers sign up for a uh, credit card. And, and actually annual fee of our credit card is actually zero. So it's actually free. <laughs> so, <laughs> can, can I so, have one of those? Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, please do sign up. Uh, so the, you know, that's just pure benefit to the customer. And if you think about where does it come from, where does that money come from? It's actually coming from saving the money of spending money on like TV commercial. You know, in, in many credit card companies actually, yeah, yeah put out the, put up the, you know, a, a booth in the, at the airport to try to, you know, uh, uh, ask, you know, do, do you want to enter this credit card? Do you want to enter this credit card? We don't do any of those. You know, we actually do everything on digital. And instead of actually using a lot of money on like physical marketing or, you know, TV commercials or, you know, uh, digital marketing, we actually spend time, uh, sorry, spend uh, money by giving back money to the, uh, the customer. And, you know, as it turns out, that's actually more efficient way of acquiring customer than, uh, you know, spending huge amount of media fees on uh, on the uh, uh, on the on, on, on the advertisement space, uh, and this is possible because our e-commerce uh, uh, marketplace was uh, has been already uh, very popular, and we are collecting millions of customers' attentions already on that site. So using that media, basically, we we could significantly lower the cost. But you know, maybe innovation was, and big surprise, I guess, to many of the people was. Uh, 
uh, this works, you know, across the different industry, right? right? So that's one idea. And another one, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I should, I should tell you, uh, I think one thing that we did for the first time in the industry was usage or, you know, uh, uh, leveraging the power of sports became the owner of baseball team in Japan. And the insight uh, that our CEO had, Miki had, was, look, everybody loves baseball in Japan. And baseball team name is called out every day, <laughs> right? You know, when, when they play the game, when the you know, uh, uh, famous player comes into your, your, your team, and every day people talk about the team's name, you know, just like, you know, uh, United States, and I was in Boston for a long time, and uh, people always talk about Red Sox. <laughs> so <laughs> people are so excited about sports. So yes. the pow power of branding and power of, you know, uh, kind of advertisement through sports was so significant. And people are doubting, right? You know, okay, how much ROI do we have for, you know, uh, owning a sports team and sponsoring it? And uh, as it turns out, it has a tremendous benefit. And now it's becoming a common place in Japan and for IT industry to own a, a, a team if you become big enough. So uh, I don't I don't think this trend has come yet to the United States, uh, but I think this is becoming an obvious statement in Japan at least. And yeah. uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, we became a sponsor a sponsor for you know Golden State Warriors uh, uh, in US and also you know uh, FC Barcelona in uh, in Spain. Right. So I do think there is that emotional connection. Um, yeah. so, so maybe owning the sports team versus just advertising during that world series or the <laughs> world cup or what have you, I think that yeah. that would be the difference. Um, but that's great. So really what you're talking about, many organizations have a vision for omni-channel and for cross-selling, but mm -hmm. the data is siloed across those lines of business. So it's mm -hmm. hard to do that. It sounds yeah. like your data is integrated across all the different lines of businesses. That's correct, yes. So how did you get to that level of, of easy data integration across mm -hmm. the different lines of businesses, particularly when you do a joint venture, for example? Right, right. Um, so historically, you know, uh, we mostly do acquisition of companies and um, it's, it's a challenge to integrate all those data. But from the get go, uh, I think our CEO had a very, very clear directive of, you know, look, if we are going to acquire a, a company, uh, integration of, it starts from integration of ID. So login ID need to be completely the same. You know, uh, I think this already has been a, a common practice across you know, Google and Facebook to, you know, uh, to align the login ID. Starting from there, uh, you know, you really have to, you know, integrate the data. So that's uh, maybe, you know, that's a key point. When you acquire, acquire a company, uh, one of the key agreements you have to make with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the other company is, you know, we have to integrate ID and data. So what, what's interesting, what I heard you say, Takuya, is that it was the CEO who said we need a consistent ID. So yeah. it sounds like it also um, requires a CEO who gets data and values mm -hmm. data. Yeah, no, uh, uh, I guess one uh, thing I'm, uh, I'm very lucky about is our CEO is a driver of data and the data strategy, yeah. You are lucky <laughs> or, or, or you're intentional. So I think many CEOs now get that, but maybe not 10 years ago. So, right. so if you, if you imagine some of the data leaders that are listening to this podcast and they're like, Oh, I wish our leadership got it, or I wish they got it to that degree. What would you advise them? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a tough uh, advice to give, <laughs> but uh, um, sorry, just uh, you know, uh, one thought that came up to me uh, what is, if the CEO has investment, investor uh, history or you know, uh, attitude, uh, those CEO tend to love data a lot. Because you know, uh, so you know, our, our CEO, Miki, uh, used to work for uh, a big bank in Japan, and he was responsible for you know, uh, uh, making investment. And 
and also uh, some master of SoftBank is a big investor, right? And he's all in in data and AI. And, and, and the reason is if you're an investor, you actually know the value of information and data and intelligence, right? And that's all, all about investment. You know, when you're actually making investment, you know, you need to know, you know, what you know other companies doing. And coming from that background, it's so natural to value data so much. So, so that's why I, I think our CEO uh, uh, from like 25 years ago is so passionate about data and information and intelligence. He, he appreciated it so deeply that, you know, it, you know there's really probably nobody else who's actually, uh, you know, so much more passionate uh, than he is, maybe except for me, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and me, I got 30 years already in this field, so. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so maybe, sorry, this is not really so much about advice, but, you know, uh, uh, one 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 way you could explain to your CEO, you know, why data should should matter uh, is, you know, those kind of angles, right? You, you know, maybe from business angle, you know, uh, you can try to excite them to look, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, a question of companies becoming a com, com practice, and you know, to acquire a customer, you really need to know those uh, information. So it is like that, right? You know, for for customers as well, uh, it's all about, you know, discovering the value that's hidden behind uh, and, you know, uh, realizing that value. And there's a gap between what people think this cu customer's, you know, uh, value should be. And then, uh, you know, what, you know, uh, other companies actually think, you know, this customer value uh, should be. And the gap is basically, you know, uh, uh, what we can actually, you know, uh, 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 know and uh, leverage. Uh, and at the same time, this gap is precisely the benefit we can give it to the customer, right? Because that, that's a customer you know, a uh, 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 subjective value as much as, you know, companies, you know, objective value to, to give services to the customer. Right. Thank you for that. So the other thing that um, Rakuten is, is innovative with or early with was the concept around digital twins. Mm -hmm. So, so for those who are not familiar with this, maybe if you can define what this means and where did you start? Was yes. it like a particular process or a particular mm -hmm. customer journey um, or vertical? Yes, thank you. Um, so, of course, you know, digital twin as a word uh, is defined in uh, you know many ways around the world, and probably you know. Uh, uh, but the way I I understand I, I use uh, the word digital twin in our company is the understanding and representation of customers' needs and true demands on a digital space, right? So the idea is the context of the customers, you know, uh, circumstances of the customers, you know, um, you cannot ask customers of those detailed circumstances all the time uh, through the service. So in one way or another, you really have to understand uh, customers' uh, wants uh, in, in, your, on, in your service side. Now, you know, uh, coming back to you, you know, your creepy side, of course, you don't want to do this. You also want to actually predict how, you know, how much people appreciate those kind of predictions, people, how much people don't appreciate those predictions. So, you know, including those, you have to, you know, model and you have to represent. So uh, the way we approach this problem is uh, just as a starting point, very simply, we create so-called customer DNA. And uh, we basically, you know, uh, because we have all, all the purchase histories and clicking histories and other things, we try to summarize, you know, what this person uh, really wants and uh, in what stage uh, people are in each of, uh, you know, uh, kind of industry uh, uh, preference, right? You know, if they play golf, you know, okay, you know, uh, how good are they, you know, you know, what kind of, you know, golf goods do they prefer, you know, how often do they play? So all those things are summarized in, in the form of, you know, uh, customer DNA. And then, uh, you know, when appropriate, you know, we actually use it to, to offer services to the customer. Okay, yeah. So some people will use it in the context of customer. For some, it's also in the context of devices in a manufacturing um, plant or yes. what, what have you. Um, That's correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you also think about the different pillars or the workflow, if you're thinking about a digital twin, or also the way your data strategy operates from collecting to building the products and then the sales to drive value and then mm -hmm. AI. Is in your role as a data leader, is there one particular area that you spend more time focusing on? 
Yeah. Of course, you know, this focus, you know, shifts probably every two years or so. Uh, and everything is, of course, important. Uh, but if you talk about recent, you know, one to two years, you know, uh, I think biggest focus I had was on the data platform. So, you know, uh, collection and management of the data. And this is because, I mean, it's becoming obvious. Uh, and I think it has been obvious for many of us uh, who's practicing AI. Um, algorithm is becoming commodity at this point. Uh, so you can, you can, you know, download open source. Uh, you can download big, you know, uh, language models and you can use it. Uh, the key differentiator of AI is on data. Okay, so that's one statement. And second statement is the advancement of ML ops, you know, uh, uh, you know, automating the entire process of machine learning as well as AI is becoming so much better, right? So, you know, uh, there are, I think, more than 400, you know, uh, different startups that try to create the AI value chain uh, more smooth and uh, easier. Uh, and because of these innovations, uh, many cloud companies have figured out uh, much better and modern architecture of data platform, right? Uh, so, you know, in terms of storage, you know, uh, maybe previously we are using Hadoop, maybe, you know, people start talking about, maybe we should move on to, you know, uh, object storage, and uh, maybe we should have, you know, a hybrid uh, architecture, such as, you know, a, a private cloud plus, you know, a public cloud together, so that you can leverage the advancement of all those ML ops and AI uh, uh, innovations on the public cloud side as well, uh, how to scale up your computations and storage space. So all those things are moving so fast and making so much easier uh, to actually, you know, make AI happen. So that, that's why my focus has been on, uh, you know, data platform. Another reason is, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, competitiveness for, you know, talent is, uh, you know, just <laughs> dramatically increasing as you, and I don't have to tell you about this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it's no better. It's no better in Tokyo than it is outside New York, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Um, because of this, you know, uh, spending more money on software and hardware to reduce uh, uh, the amount of labor on kind of, you know, uh, uh, structuring things uh, is, is much cheaper than trying to hire another, you know, data engineer to try to fix things. So uh, at this point of time, it just makes so much more sense to spend more money on and the resources on uh, trying to buy software and hardware as much as possible before you start assigning, you know, a, a very capable, you know, data engineers that assign this on the platform. So, you know, it's just obvious trend that, you know, uh, of course, if you cannot hire, uh, you know, enough people, why don't we spend more money on the resources on the platform side? Yeah. So ha how much have you gone through a modernization and yeah. did, did COVID accelerate that or were you already well on your way there? Yeah, no, to be absolutely frank with, uh, you know, everybody, you know, I think our journey uh, for this was uh, a little bit later than, I, you know, I, you know, I, I thought I, I should have started. So already from, I would say one to two years ago, we started, you know, uh, uh, completely modernizing our architecture. You know, uh, so our leader, you know, Rohit and Sandy uh, in San Mateo are leading this effort. Uh, and we are we are already well into this uh, journey, and uh, we are uh, you know uh, close to you know uh, uh, basically finishing phase one of this journey. So you know uh, yes you know uh, uh, but you know I think this is a key you know this is gonna uh, you know uh, keep evolving. Uh, yeah. So you know I think it's gonna be more about how to create a culture of learning from outside, and then try to integrate what's what's uh, what's feasible. Yeah, so as part of this um, modernization, are there, and, and the move to the cloud, are there any best practices that you found about an approach, whether it's lift and shift yeah. or lift and redesign or build net new yeah. and learn and upskill then, or any best practices there? Right, um, really frankly, you know, the, the, the best practice is really to learn from outside. You know, uh, there's so many, because venture, uh, uh, capital money is flowing into this, you know, ridiculous amount. So there are so many people, so much money, so much effort going on to try to make things easier. So before you try to build yourself, you know, what you think is necessary, it's really better to look around and then see if there are other, you know, companies who can help you. Especially for big companies like, like us, you know, uh, typically 
you know, again, you know, uh, uh, money is less of an issue than people. So, right. you know, uh, don't spend, uh, you know, too much energy trying to reinvent the wheel. So that's really a uh, best practice. Just, you know, uh, uh, be humble and try to learn from outside and try to, you know, uh, leverage what's, what's, already, what's already there. Second thing is, you know, there's a big trend to, uh, you know, uh, get away from uh, uh, what do you call lock-in situation uh, from, you know, vendors and uh, particular, uh, you know, softwares, right? And uh, this is quite, quite a bit, you know, uh, I think interesting link with, you know, uh, you know Web3 trend. Uh, the you know people are now uh, not appreciating you know a completely centralized approach of everything you know I think people are trying to decentralize and you know uh, uh, learning from open source communities I think I think people are trying to not be so dependent on a single you know uh, uh, software a single company so you know because of this trend there are many uh, solutions out there uh, that you know uh, try to help you decentralize you know, uh, your solutions uh, so that you do not become uh, dependent on a single company. So uh, I think you know, uh, another you know, kind of best practice is you, know, uh, you can, uh, previously maybe it was uh, uh, much harder to actually you know, have a hybrid you know, approach between let's say you know, uh, uh, having you know, different data centers uh, you know, in different places, uh, you know, having a you know, multi-cloud you know, uh, uh, strategies, uh, you know, uh, trying to use more than one uh, you know, public cloud as well as private cloud. But now those solutions exist. So you know, I think you know, people should look around and try to you know, utilize them. Yes, it still takes us a little bit of effort, but I think it's worthwhile pursuing. And lastly, you know, uh, uh, together with that you know, uh, trend, uh, there are more uh, 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 companies who are trying to help uh, move, move, moving of data from one storage to the other uh, and make it, making it smooth. And that movement of data, you know, if people have gone through migration process, it's, it's extremely painful. But now I think it's getting better. So I, I think you know, uh, there are you know, people who are willing to help us. Uh, as long as you have you know, uh, spending enough money, of course. <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah, that's a bit surprising. So it comes back a little bit to money, but your, your view is that it's still the people. So are there, um, what are some of the practices that you've adopted to change the mindsets and also the skills yes. for this data-driven digital cloud world? Thank you, Shindy. Uh, so within our company, uh, because our CEO is so committed uh, to this, you know, uh, we are having, so prior to COVID-19, uh, uh, we used to have quarterly uh, camp for AI strategy for all the executives in Russian group. So, you know, uh, executive officer and the wolf, uh, because we acquire so many companies across the globe, you know, uh, we have, maybe more than 100 you know, uh, executives uh, across the globe, everybody have to attend this you know, AI camp. This takes whole day, uh, every quarter. And we gather, we used to gather in a physical place like India, San Mateo, or Tokyo. And we, we pack the, all the executives into, into, into a room. And then we have the full day discussions on the strategy of AI. Every few okay. months. So that, that's a huge commitment, right? That is a quarterly AI boot camp for executives. I love it. Yes. And because of the COVID-19, we couldn't do this anymore in physical space and because, because of travel restrictions. So, you know, our CEO decided we should do this now every two weeks. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> 30 minutes online. So 30 minutes. Okay. Well, yes. bite size is good. As, yes, as long yes. as it's not eight hours every two weeks. Oh my goodness. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> so. It's called an AI showcase. So you know, uh, so I have a you know a portfolio or product lineup for AI products, and then uh, I have a you know a big map uh, of you know uh, you know what product we should build for AI. And for each product, uh, is you know product manager presents uh, their progress, you know future, in perspective, and how this product should help the entire Rackin group uh, uh, within thirty minutes uh, every two weeks. And we have active discussions on you know you know which direction they should go, you know what should we do. So. Uh, that, that's a sorry executive level, you know, involvement. So you know, uh, of course, you know, this kind of activity of the executive should cascade down uh, to you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody in the company. Uh, and uh, in, I think that's uh, you know, uh, uh, that's another thing we do. So we help them, uh, you know, appreciate uh, this kind of data and AI innovations by providing uh, you know data intelligence uh, training. So and and this is actually you know, this is more like a kind of Japanese uh, style, but you know. 
we have about 20,000 you know, uh, employees in Rakuten. It's probably a little bit more now, so maybe close to 30,000. Uh, but everybody, including executives, uh, are required to take this you know, data intelligence training uh, we created. It, it's just a one hour and a half uh, training course. You know? So it's, uh, it's broken up into like 10 minutes you know, uh, short you know, uh, micro learning. But you know, uh, still, so it teaches everybody in the company about how to utilize data, you know, uh, in a business setting. So you know, uh, that that's uh, <laughs> that's a way of. No, that sounds like a fabulous data fluency program. Really, that is required of everyone. Um, are there also ways that you focus on upskilling data professionals? so that they learn these new technologies or what are the incentives there? That's a, that's a great point. Uh, to be frank, I'm, uh, uh, I think I need to accelerate that aspect uh, a bit more. We, we do have uh, within tech community, uh, certain training program provided by uh, each of our leaders, you know, uh, the leaders of uh, you know, uh, algorithms or the leader of you know, their platform. Uh, have a, have sessions uh, to teach whoever wants to take it. Uh, maybe about you know fifty people, you know, uh, classroom like you know uh, sessions for you know just you know a couple hours for each topic. Uh, but you know I, I think this is not yet good enough. Again, I as I talk with my you know uh, friends in US and you know uh, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, who are uh, very good at those technologies. I learned so much about you know what's new technology coming out. What are the new concepts that's coming up? You know maybe recently you know uh, uh, the concept of you know uh, 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 data uh, you know uh, quality uh, checking you know uh, data monitoring uh, is is coming or up. Observability, so, yeah, data observability exactly. is another observability. one coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So you know, uh, uh, so there are many tools you know that allows you to do this easily uh, for many different you know cloud cloud settings and others. So you know, uh, maybe studying of each of those tools and uh, you know uh, what's the benefit those tools can bring to Rakuten Group. Uh, those kind of study group need to happen much more. So you know, maybe that's part of what I should be initiating. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like Rakuten has an amazing education program for leaders as well as all employees. What about you personally as a data mm -hmm. leader? How do you stay up to date with everything? Do you read? Do you take classes? Do you podcast? What do you do? Yeah, no, I, I, I do actually everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> so podcast is actually uh, one of my uh, favorite. Uh, so Anderson Horowitz uh, has a very strong, you know, data focus. So, you know, I, I do, you know, uh, listen to Anderson Horowitz podcast. News Leaders has been uh, extremely, you know, uh, good, you know, uh, has been uh, one of my favorite um, way of learning. Uh, I'm actually uh, like, a, you know, a reading person uh, than listening person uh, in general. So, you know, uh, uh, I subscribe to a few uh, newsletters, especially actually startup uh, uh, newsletters. So uh, a few VCs actually send out a list of you know uh, 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 startup company that just finished the race, right? You know, uh, hopefully that's a sign of success of that company. Yes, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you hope. You hope we're not just hope, throwing yeah. money out there. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you know, I actually take a look at you know maybe you know five to ten uh, lists of companies every day. And then uh, I, I read, you know, uh, briefly, you know, TechCrunch and other, you know, blogs, you know, what this company is about. And it, when I, if I get curious, you know, I actually give, a, you know, a, a deep dive into the company's technology, you know, what its offer is. And sometimes I ask for the demo uh, if we can use that, you know, technology. So by doing so, you know, you can actually, you know, uh, be pretty much up to date. Um, you know, uh, those sort of companies have a very good understanding of the industry. And uh, I found that's the best way to learn. Yeah, yeah te TechCrunch and the VC uh, newsletters shows me that you're read you're really on the hunt for innovations. It's not just <laughs> the mainstream trends; it's the innovations. Yeah. So, so Ra Rakuten has its core businesses, but you also have some moonshot ideas. Are you allowed yes. to talk about these? Of course. Uh, okay. Two things, yeah. Two things I want to mention. So, one is you know uh, uh, Rakuten Medical, uh, which is our 
kind of big bold approach to try to cure cancer. You know, we are uh, 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 we basically you know uh, uh, try to invent photoimmunotherapy. And the idea is, you know, this idea was uh, actually invented and discovered uh, by NIH, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, researcher uh, called Kobayashi Sensei. And uh, what he found out was, you know, uh, uh, if you actually, you know, uh, uh, take the medicine uh, that has certain chemical, and that, that chemical will attach to the cancer cell, and if you shine infrared uh, red light on that, you know, cancer cell, the cancer cell ruptures. And uh, that medicine uh, has been approved in Japan uh, as a clinical uh, uh, medicine. And uh, in, in, the, in the rest of the, in the world, you know, we try to you know, uh, get more approvals to actually deliver those medicines to, to the world. Now, how AI plays a role in here, um, our research team in India uh, tried to uh, gather you know, uh, biomarkers to identify which patients actually uh, respond to this medicine better. So, you know, in, in the world of personalized medicine, uh, we, we all know biology is so complicated that not, in, not a single solution works for everybody, right? And I think, you know, certain solutions work for certain segment of customers and, and patients, and that's good enough, you know, as long as it works for some people. But, you know, we need to know, you know, uh, which patients respond to certain, you know, treatment better. Right? So, you know, that, you know, uh, a process of discovering, you know, which patients respond better is now investigated through, you know, machine learning and AI uh, in, our, in our lab. So that's one uh, mutual project. Yeah, so I love that. That's so inspiring. I hope it pays off. Um, you said you're an avid reader, and it makes me think of a chapter in a book I was just reading, Soonish. And one of the mm -hmm. chapters is on personalized medicine. I, I don't know. Have you have you read it by chance no, or familiar no, yeah, with it? Okay, I, I'm going to send you that link. But interestingly, this author um, did talk about in personalized medicine the main mm -hmm. blocker is, so there's so much data that we're creating more data, but again, mm -hmm. not, not enough skilled people to actually mm -hmm. leverage that data. Um, I don't correct. know if you're seeing that with, with the personalized medicine as well. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's absolutely correct. And uh, this, this world, this, this industry is going to evolve so fast in the next five years. I have a, I'm pretty optimistic about this. Yeah, that's and, exciting. <laughs> So if I if I may, I want to talk about another moonshot, you know, uh, project that you know that's a uh, uh, maybe a more you know, kind of you know, dear to my heart. Uh, you know, my background is theoretical physics, and uh, I uh, uh, you know I used to work in uh, Harvard uh, to try to propose materials that can be uh, you know a foundation for new quantum computer. So you know, uh, so I, 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 you know, I, 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 I was funded by you know certain like a, a you know a fund uh, that supports uh, building of a quantum computer before, and when I joined Rakuten, and of course, you know, I, you know, I was uh, getting away from you know all the physics uh, that I was doing before, so I didn't know I was going to come back. But now, uh, eight, eight, nine years later, you know, uh, finally actually came back to my old uh, you know uh, theoretical physics background. Now we actually are working uh, with. A company called Quera, which is a uh, you know a, a quantum computer company uh, built by Harvard professors and MIT professors uh, to actually uh, try to challenge new paradigm of building quantum computer. And so now um, as Rakuten, uh, we are the investor for you know Quera uh, to try to you know uh, uh, you know uh, propose uh, you know different ways of using quantum computer uh, for commercial purposes. And because you know, have a you know the, the professor who's actually built this company uh, uh, is uh, my uh, mentor, uh, has been my mentor throughout my you know, career as a theoretical physicist. So you know, finally we I came back and then started collaborating on, on this project. Yeah, that's wonderful that life can come full circle like that. But Taikuya, I'm listening to these two moonshot projects and thinking, mm -hmm. wait, how do you run the the day job of the of the data, <laughs> <laughs> the data and analytics? So. So how do you do it? Or maybe how do you divide your time um, yes. when I would imagine I personally would want to work on uh, the medical and curing cancer 100%? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, it's more like a, you know, uh, time-wise, I allocate my energy, I guess. As I, as I told you, my, my, my uh, focus shifts every one year or two years. And 
of course, all of my uh, 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 you know, colleagues are extremely capable, right? You know, uh, the people who run this platform, Rohit is extremely capable. Uh, uh, the leader who runs, you know, AI products, uh, Ashish Pandey, uh, is extremely capable, right? And and uh, that the person who's running R and D, uh, Rakuten Institute Technology, uh, his name is Ankara Data, uh, he's also extremely capable. So, you know, uh, I guess every year I I focus on a certain like a uh, area, and then try to create a strategy, new directions, and you know, uh, 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 you know, can explore, you know, what's what's possible, and then together with those leaders. And then and I, I try to empower those leaders to 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 grow the you know uh, uh, visions and directions and missions together. And then once you know uh, maybe half a year passed, you know uh, I think those leaders uh, 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 you know are running these you know uh, uh, programs uh, uh, very good. So you know I can move on to another one. So uh, I think it's uh, you know if we try to do everything at the same time, yeah, this is a little bit too much. You know uh, my you know my team is uh, close to well, more than actually you know one thousand people now. So it's a little bit too much. So you know, I try yeah. to do a focus on a lot, a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, but it's about having the good team around you. Well, Taiku, this has been such an inspiring conversation, but I always like to end with one of two questions and I'll let you choose. If you think about in the last year, something that's just made you laugh out loud or what are you most grateful for? It's a great question. Um, let me think. Yeah, take your time. No, this is rather uh, maybe you know obvious statement, but I'm just so grateful to all my friends who spend time with me, right? So um, I didn't you know talk about this in this uh, podcast too much, but you know I actually also run a foundation called Wellbeing Foundation. So I, I think about wellbeing a lot, and. We spent so much time on doing things, right? Doing things together, trying to achieve things together. But when it comes to, you know, uh, your well-being, uh, as it turns out, what matters is, you know, uh, not so much of, of doing together, but being together, right? Maybe you're not doing anything, like you know, let's say, you know, you're, you know, uh, you're in front of fire, uh, you know, together, you know, uh, you know, campfire together, and you're sitting there and not doing anything. Maybe that's uh, that's a memory you remember when you actually. You know, uh, uh, when you're not uh, doing very well, right? So, <laughs> um, yes, you know, doing together, you know, it's fantastic. You know, I really appreciate everybody who's doing trying to achieve things together with me. But at the same time, I am so grateful for those people who actually spend time with me, even if there, there aren't so many things we are achieving together. Uh, you know, uh, all the more, right? You know, because you know, I'm, I'm probably not you know providing value anywhere <laughs> in that in that journey. You know, I'm so grateful that, you know, there are people who are willing to spend time with me without, uh, you know, uh, too many objectives. And maybe that's an uh, aspect of life that's, uh, you know, uh, being missed out in uh, capital capitalism uh, a little too much. The value of being together rather than doing together, uh, probably, you know, uh, uh, will, will, will be reverted. And uh, so, you know, I think, you know, uh, just, you know, last year, you know, if I reflect back, you know, uh, I'm just, you know, uh, and my, my colleagues in, in, in the company is also the same, you know, uh, we spend so much time together, maybe without really not achieving too much, right? We discuss, brainstorm many ideas, but we are not really going anywhere. But it's that those time are so important for me, right? you know, uh, those are the time exactly that, you know, give me an energy to do things. Uh, so that, that's yeah. what I have been grateful. Yeah, so that um, so well said and well being, of course, I think everyone's had an awakening about the importance of this. And I like the image of you and your friends around the campfire. So, Takuya, uh, if I can say it correctly, <laughs> Domo Arigato for being on oh. the Data Chief. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thank you.